Uh, she's got some uh, masters and doctorates in terms of formational leadership and uh, her uh, knowledge of scripture, especially Old Testament scripture. Whenever I have a question as I'm working on a message, I just call her and she helps me with the Hebrew. She's truly amazing, but I think if you spend any time with her, you're going to find her passion is primarily for the next generation, along with being a principal at uh, what used to be known as Cathedral of the Valley over in es Escondido, um, and as well as the Bible College over there. She has a passion for reaching the next generation with Christ, and she, her idea is that it's never supposed to be us and them. That even if our, our kids are all grown up, that all of us would feel that responsibility and that calling to pour our faith into the next generation. And so I, I just hope, and if you guys want the notes, they're on the tables around you. I want to encourage you to follow along as well as on our app. But would you guys just give a super warm welcome to the director of House Kids, Pat Close. saw this morning that we've been having fun in house kids over the summer. In fact, we have had so much fun with that superhero theme that Pastor John has bought us curriculum to ride through till next May. So we're going to leave all of those figures that you see on the If you've been back there, you've got to go check it out. All the figures on the wall. As I first walked in and Robin was showing them to me, she told me they took her a hundred hours. So we kind of get a, an idea of the kind of passion and purpose that she has for our kids. And I just wanted to give you just a few facts about what we did this summer and um, where we're going from there. We added a number of teachers. Like John said, we grew. We added teachers to our team. We're really a fun team back there. We work hard, but we have fun. And I'm going to be talking to you this morning about joining that team. We added helpers. And the kids just had fun. Our theme and what we tried to accomplish was positive reinforcement. We had absolutely no discipline problems. And you're probably going, yeah. <laughs> we didn't. You saw that herd of kids. But what we did is we reused what we've done before here is the Bible bucks theory. And everything they did, they got bucks for. So I just want to warn you now, we're cashing them in today, and you may be the proud owner of a six-foot stuffed squid by the end of the day. And if we have an issue with that, please talk to Bob. We have a number of prizes back there, and they've been scheming on the squid and octopus all quarter. Well, if you didn't know before now, this program was the creative genius of Robin. She had this program in her heart for a number of years, and she brought it to John and I this spring, and we said, yes, we can do it. We can do that. And so off we went. And we had a lot of help. I, I'm not going to try to name everyone, because I'll, I'll forget somebody, and somebody won't, won't be happy with me. But we had Tim joining our, uh, along with us joining our teaching team, and will be staying with us. T Tim has taught for a long time. And we really rely on our helpers. We couldn't do what we do in children's ministry without a lot of people coming alongside. And we're stretched. We'll admit what we did stretched a lot of people, but we're excited. We're excited because we're going to keep moving from where we've been. And if any of you have parented for more than five minutes, you might know that while parenting is an exciting adventure, it's also a challenge. You may find that by the time you get the whole thing wrapped around, you, you understand how to parent that first one, along comes another one who's completely different. And the, the things that you use for that first child aren't going to work on the second one. So at that point, you might say, God, give me some help here. Well, you know, when that first little Shabamba is born, you probably have these desires and these plans for this child. You want them to be responsible and productive. You want them to be dependable, to take their place in society in the given occupation of their choice. And if you come from an edu educational family like I did, you might encourage that child to go as far as they can and stretch the limits of who they are. All of that's wonderful, and I'm sure you all did that. But in all of that, my prayer is that the Christian education of our children is foremost in our thinking. And it's not going to happen because it should. It's not going to happen by osmosis. The issue is who's responsible. Yeah. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Who do we look to for the Christian education of our children? And the first uh, 
discussion question that you'll notice in your notes that we're going to look at is how as godly parents can we take seriously the priorities of raising our children? How can we nurture them into things of the Lord? How can we teach them the things that, the skills and the knowledge that they're going to need to know to, to live productive Christian lives? And that's, that's the challenge. And I'm going to, we're going to read a number of scriptures, and yeah, some of them are a little bit long, but there is a purpose there. And as John said, I love the Old Testament. And we're going to look at a couple of scriptures that God, as he's preparing his people to go in and take the land out of Egypt in a mighty exodus, Moses is going to lead them out. And in the midst of all the challenges that they lie ahead in conquering the land and killing the enemy, God speaks concerning children. And you know, like, like John said, you know, we don't have children's ministry, so you can sit in here and listen to these wonderful messages and listen to the angel, angel's wings flutter. You know, Pastor Coleman Phillips, who's now gone to be with the Lord, used to say something from the pulpit often. He said that prominence isn't important. What we're doing in here is important. We're gathering together, we're worshiping, we're being encouraged by the word. But what's being done in the back room is just as important. Because we're coming alongside you and we're raising up the next generation. I'm always thinking in those terms. I look at these little little people. And these are our leaders a generation down the road. These are kids that are going to take their place in various occupations in our world. And they're going to be leading us. And that's an exciting thought. It's a daunting one, too. The first passage that I want to look at is Deuteronomy. And I put it on my iPad so I can make it bigger. Um, Deuteronomy um, 6, 1 to 9. And in that passage, again, giving it context, Moses is speaking to this generation coming out of Egypt in a mighty exodus. And he's telling them, this is what's going to be important as you go in and take that land. Now, Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments, but the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you are going to possess it. So that you and your son, there they are, your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes, his commandments, which I have commanded you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. Lost my place. Here, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I have commanded you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons as you talk to them, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be on the frontal on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And you know, this is so interesting to me as I've looked at this passage through the years. Because remember, as we see this in context, this is the generation coming out of Egypt. They have a huge task before them, which is to conquer the land and boot out the enemy. We'll get to that in a few minutes, how well they did there. However, you know, as you look at this, you might be thinking as I'm talking, oh, you know, get a grip here. I work, you know? Laundry doesn't wash itself. Dishes don't magically appear in the dishwasher. I've got a life here. And so, you know, you're wondering, how can you expect me to educate my children? That's what schools are for. That's what the government is for. Well, yes, ma'am, it sure is. But however, in the midst of all of that, Moses is saying, I'm giving you the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments. Why? So the phrase, now we're reading out of the NAS, which, you know, is a little bit less complex. In the King James, there's that phrase, observe to do. And what Moses is saying through the inspiration of the Lord, he's saying, I'm giving you these commands. Not to mess up your day. I'm giving them to you that you would observe to do. That you would look at them with a direct intent to reproduce the action. God is saying to you, this is what's important to you, Israel. He's saying as to us today as the church, this is important. As we're doing our working, our conquering, whatever it is we're doing, selling real estate. Um, it's important that these children that God has given us are educated in things of the Lord. It's important that they know and serve the God that we serve. And like I said, in all of our teaching and our working and our working with our children, that we are aware of what their needs are spiritually. That, that, uh, that says twice there, hero Israel. And you know, it's interesting that we're here. 
I remember when I was a, a fairly new believer and I would read the Bible and it would say, the prophets would say to Israel, you know, I told you to do this and this and this, but you didn't hear me. And I thought, yeah, they heard them, they just didn't do it. And, but in the Hebrew economy, that word Shema, Shema Bechol, it's an active hearing. In, in bound up in that word here was the presumption that they would do it. And that's why James says in James 1.22, don't just be hearers of the word, but doers also, lest you become self-deceived. So God is saying to the people of Israel here, you are to teach your children. And it's not just these two minutes a day where we sit down, let's talk about God. No, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that's lived for the Lord. And you know what education, I have an educational background. I taught junior hires for years. And I know some of the elementary teachers would feel like we were nuts. But you know, there, there, there are uh, benefits there. Junior hires don't wet their pants and throw up in the classroom. <laughs> I do have, never in my years of teaching did I have anybody throw up in there. And I thought that was fabulous. But anyway, it is, <laughs> oh, I guess, moving on. In verses 4 and 5, it says, Here Israel, hear Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your might. And, to, you know, I, I talk about this, and it's exciting. I, I look at these little kids, and I think it's so exciting to think of what God is going to do in this next generation. And as we look at this section right here about loving God, there's two verses I... I want to mention and then explain. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. You know what is so important here? In education, we look at this and think, well, we are very intricately made. You know, uh, Psalms 119 says we're beautifully and wonderfully made. That, that word wonderful has an implication of unique. Every once in a while I think, God, say, God, there's only one of me. There's only one of me. There's only one of you, and your children are, are all unique. But what, what the Lord is saying here is that when Jesus comes with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to write that law in your heart. Yeah. And I believe the role of parents here is to take their children and put healthy boundaries around them, to instruct them, to protect them. When they're little short people, you know, the tendency is reach up and put their fingers on the stove. They want to know what's going on. To run out in the street. Hopefully by the time they're 10 or 15, they're not doing those things. But we're putting those boundaries around them to teach them to hear the voice of their father. Yeah. Over and over in Proverbs, it says, my son, listen to the voice of your father. Hear the instruction of your mother. So those boundaries are meant to protect your child until that day on an ongoing basis that is written in their hearts. Yeah. Our children are going to learn to respond to God's word through us so that as they raise up, they're able to hear God. They're able to understand his voice. They're able to hear what is God saying to them concerning their purpose, the destiny. What does God ha have for their children? You know, that's exciting with each child is different. You know, as raising my kids, I had seriously had a word over each one of them. And as, as you watch that unfolding, I remember pray, uh, praying for one of them. And that word over them was consistency, and that's not what I was looking at. And I remember going to the Lord and saying, something's not working here. And the Lord turned me to Romans 4, 17 that says, God sees that which is not as if it is. Yeah. Now what that means is, in, in the fruition of time, this is who that person is. You pray. You get on your face and don't you know, agonize with the Lord over what you're seeing now. But you pray what God has for that child as they move on. Your question to me this morning might be, wowza, how am I going to do all this? How am I going to raise my child in things of the Lord? I want to give us a couple of examples today, but you know what it is? It's one day at a time. It's one day at a time of you loving the Lord. Like it says in Deuteronomy, you loving the Lord with all of your heart, soul, and mind. Might, and with the priority that you put on the relationship with the Lord, that is the extent to which your, your children will, will know and serve the Lord. In education, there's a couple of accents. And one question that is posed is, do children in their learning, is it caught or is it taught? And my answer to that is both and. Children learn what they live. So yes, they're going to, they'll, they'll be taught a whole lot in schools, at home. Hopefully, at homes, they're taught the way of the Lord. But also, they'll learn 
they'll live what they, they learn what they live. Children can recognize a, a hypocrite at 10 paces. You know, that saying, do as I say, not as I do. That's so crippling to children. Yeah. Children look to you. You are their first teachers. You are the first picture of who Jesus Christ should be to them. And that will grow with them. And yes, there may be a period of time where they decide to say, no thanks, that's not for me. But you know what? They, they come back. And that's an exciting process to walk through. You know, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that we look at the Old Testament. You might wonder why am I teaching from the Old Testament. But it tells us that we look to the Old Testament for two reasons. As an example and as an admonition. Now, an admonition, we don't use that word in the English much. You know, you hear your kid come home from school. I learned a new word today. But that is literally a warning with a negative in sight. So what I love about Scripture, you see the good, the bad, and the ugly. So an admonition, an example of that would be, you know, the Israelites coming out of Egypt and into the land, they were told, the next scripture that we're going to read, how they were to do that. And if we would put up Deuteronomy 7, 1 to 5, another fairly long one, and as I get to it, now again, they're coming into the land, and uh, it says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, the Hittites, all, all the seven nations greater and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, not favor them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor their sons to your daughters. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. And he will quickly destroy, destroy you. And it goes on. Isn't it interesting? As God is preparing this huge nation of people to go in under Joshua's leader, leadership into the conquest years. Every time, what does he do? Stops and said, be mindful of your children. Not only are you to teach them. Are you to provide for them an authentic lifestyle that involves the life of Christ around you. But further, he's saying, it's important who you put them in contact with. Now, the context here, the Lord is saying through Moses and Deuteronomy, when you get into the land, there's all these bites all over the place. Hittites, where they are. All over. And these 12 tribes of Israel, and we're going to go inherit their land by tribe. God is saying, don't live with them. They were to kill them off, get them out of there. Because he says you're not to live with them, marry them, serve their gods. Don't give your sons to their daughters. Don't give your daughters to their sons. It's important that you do not culturally adapt. Why? God's people were called to be monotheistic. They were a one God serving people. Over against the many polytheistic cultures who basically would honor and serve anything that stood still long enough to become a God. And so God is saying don't do that. You know, Paul says the same thing in in uh, Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word conform means pressed into shape. Don't take on the cultural mindset. You know, your heroes, let's don't have them be whoever's the latest pop star or who's in the media. Let's teach them like we're doing this summer. Let's teach them real heroes from the Bible. He says, but be transformed, be changed from the inside by the word of God, by the changing of your mind. That's what God is saying to his people. Old Testament clear into the New Testament. He's saying do not culturally adapt. You're to bind those children, the, child, the word of God around your children. Now a negative example here are these Canaanites as they, as they go in, excuse me, as the Israelites as they go in, the failure of the second generation is very clear. We know the first gener generation came up to Kadesh, but Aaron said, no thanks, we're not going in. So God took them out for a 40-year spin around the desert as the next generation comes up. And now they're, they hear Deuteronomy 6, they hear Deuteronomy 7, they knew the word of the Lord, they go in under Joshua, and they conquer the land. But you might remember they were supposed to boot the enemy out. Read Judges 1, tribe after tribe, and they did not remove the enemy from the land. You might think, big whoop, what's wrong with that? Well... Probably the saddest verse in scripture in my mind is in Judges 2, yeah. verse 7. It says, and so the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua 
Verse 9, here's the thing. It says, and there arose a generation who did not know the Lord or the mighty acts of Israel. You know, you might think, oh, that's not sad. Yeah, that is sad. Why, we've got a whole generation of young people who don't know who God is. Do you remember as they crossed the Jordan, the Lord told the head of each tribe to put a rock on the far side of the Jordan? And that wasn't just for a cute little, little display. That was meant to be an altar. It says so that when your son says, hey, Pops, what's with the rocks? You were to say, God met me there. God met me there. This is what God did. This is how God brought us into the land. But here we have a whole generation who didn't know the Lord. And that will set the trajectory for Israel's course. We're going to have a land full of idolatry. Why? Because they intermarried. They gave their sons. They gave their daughters. But lest we come disheartened, I just want to quickly give you a positive example. That was an admonition. But I'm going to talk a little bit about King David. And I've done a lot of study on David. I, I just love this man and what he accomplished. And yes, there is a dichotomy there. We know that he failed in the matter with Bathsheba and it had long-term implications in the lives of his sons, Absalom and Adonijah. But David, you know, you wonder what is it about David that God loved? He's called a man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the light of Israel. And you know, I don't know if you're like, I don't know why. Why? Because he was a worshiper. That man knew how to hit the deck and repent when the time was there. But that man loved God. And so David now, he in 2 Samuel 5, he, at his third anointing, he's taking over rulership of the United Kingdom of Israel. He had three priorities. And if you listen to this, it's all centered in his relationship with the Lord. He loved the Lord. And he's got sons from any number of wives. But David now, in, in taking the throne, 2 Samuel 5, he gets the Jebusites out of Jerusalem. He goes to battle. You might think, Jeb, they're still there. From back from the time of Joshua, they weren't out of there. It's kind of like having a tiny, that's kind of a scary thought. The Chinese in Washington, D.C., what are they doing there? You know, the, the Jebusites never belonged there, so David got them out of there. The second thing he does in 2 Samuel 6, he brings the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. And you remember that passage where he takes off his kingly robes and in his ephod of a servant, he's bebopping into Jerusalem with the Ark. That's no force for a shuffle. That guy had it going on. And he is so excited. The Ark of the Covenant is now in the rightful place in Jerusalem. Because remember, Jerusalem is not only the capital of Israel, it's the seat of covenant worship. This is about worship. And finally, the desire of David's heart was to build a temple. To, because he looked at his house of, Caesar, of cedar, and he saw this tent, and he said, God needs, God needs a house of worship. And so he tells the prophet Nathan, and initially Nathan, Nathan tells him, do what's in your heart. But then the word of the Lord came to Nathan and said, no, David will not build. And you know, this is where I see the character of David. Nathan comes back and tells David, no, he will not build. And David doesn't get his knickers in a twist. He doesn't get all in the house because he doesn't have the honor and the prestige of building the house of the Lord. But David listens. And along with what Nathan says, you'll see it in First Chronicles 22, 8, and 9. It says, David, you're a man of war. You've shed much blood. But your son Solomon, which is a derivative of Shalom, O peaceful one, will reign in peace. This is not an indictment. That's not saying to David, you know, you can shed blood, pal. No, that is just saying, David, this is what I called you to. David was a warrior. The, the kingdom of Israel was to its largest extent boundary-wise during David's reign. There was no worship in Israel, or there was no idolatry in Israel during David's reign. He, he wouldn't allow it. So David now, understanding the word of the Lord, he raises up Solomon. If you read the next three chapters, Second uh, Samuel 8, 9, and 10, he's warring the borders. Why? He's securing it for Solomon so that that young man would reign in peace. He nurtures that boy. Read First Chronicles 28 and 29 over and over. My son, serve the Lord. Love the Lord. Be strong. Do what God's called you to. It's, it's, a, it's a long story, and I hope sometime you take the time to look through it. And finally... It says in 1 Chronicles 29, he not only gave David the material, but the pattern that the Holy Spirit gave him. So David, and in that section it says, I have prepared with all my heart the house for the Lord. David's heart was toward worship, and that heart was given to his son Solomon, who will make many mistakes. 
But I tell you, this is the one thing he didn't err in. He built that, that uh, temple for the Lord. And 1 Kings 9 tells us how beautiful that was and that it was the Lord's desire. Well, moving on to the second point, much like the first, in the New Testament, God is still giving parents the responsibility to raise their children in the Lord. That wasn't just an Old Testament principle. You might be thinking slick, but what about the New Testament? Uh, Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Those words as they're used there has to do with all the knowledge that that child will need to live a good, strong life. That that child would have not only strong faith, but a moral character that can choose wisely concerning the Word of God. Yes, I'm passionate about raising raising children in the church. You, you know, you're seeing here this morning, God's called parents to educate your children. We can't abdicate that to the state. We can't abdicate to the church or to the Christian school. When I was in administration at the school, I, in talking to parents, I would often ask them, what is the spiritual climate of your home? And ask, talk about their responsibility. And one parent actually said to me, that's what I pay you for. See, and, and you know what? That just gave us more reasons to pray for that child. But that's our responsibility into the home, to nurture the life of Christ into our children. And the question today, I'm coming back around, the question, what is the role of the church? We're coming alongside. We're coming alongside you, and we're taking seriously what we do in house. We're going to have fun back there. We're going to continue superheroes clear through May. I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you, but... Next summer, we're going to be teaching Star Wars. And John's, John already bought me a book, so it's, it's the gospel in Star Wars. And we're going to be writing the, the scripture right into it. We are going to have fun. We're excited about that. We're going to come alongside. We take it seriously. We love your kids. We want to be a part of their upbringing. We want to facilitate what you're doing in the home. And we will do that a week at a time. And in your... In your um, thing back there, you've got connect cards. I want to encourage you to be a part of what we're doing in, in house kids. Right now, like Pastor said, we're growing. We have a lot of little faces back there. And we want to break that group up into two. And we need eight people right away that are willing to say, hey, I'd love to come back. And some of these classes you don't need to teach. And the older ones, you know, you do. And none of them bite. And they're a lot of fun. And I would encourage you to pray about that. And I know some of you would rather have a root canal than go back and get work in children's ministry. I know. And some of you, as you pass down that hall, you kind of want to go this way so they don't see you and ask you to do something. I get it. But remember, we're here to help you. We're here to facilitate the life of Christ in your children. And we're excited about that. We're planning. And what we did also this summer is we removed Robin from the weekly rotation and freed her up. She is now our program director, which, which she's going to do special events. We've already got truck or treats moving on. We're, we're talking about Thanksgiving. We're talking about Christmas, all the events, and that's what this woman shines at, as you saw that this morning. Let's pray, can we? Let's, let's encourage one another in things of the Lord. Let's encourage each other. If you don't have children here at the church, don't feel like you don't belong. There's a lot of us back there that don't have young children, but still are excited about what we're doing with, with other people's kids. Lord, thank you for the children that you've given us. And Father, we hold sacredly, we hold dear the uh, responsibility to educate our children. Lord, we want them to know you as we know you. We want them to, to not have to wonder as they grow up who loves them because they're going to know. They're not going to have to wonder who they serve because they're going to know who to serve. Thank you for that, Lord. Your word says that you are no respecter of persons. And as we've seen you faithful in David's life and Moses' life and whoever's life there is, Lord, you will be faithful in our lives with our children. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give a hand? She doesn't really know her scripture. You know, it's like, you might need to get a little bit more into that word. Oh my goodness, like, most of that was just all up here. More importantly, it was all right here, and I hope that you uh, caught that today, is that God has called all of us to take ownership, right, of the next generation. Those of us that have kids, those of us that don't have kids, those of us who have kids have already grown. And it's, it's so interesting because when uh, our youth pastor transitioned out and I stepped in uh, as the, the 
old youth pastor now. Um, it, it's, it, I was going, God, I am just, I, I can't do this. And, and God's like, actually, you just got a promotion. You just got a promotion because now I get to remind you that this is where your best should be given is to the next generation. And so as, as Pat was talking, uh, whether you're interested in just volunteering, you know, once every, uh, you know, uh, month or once, you know, every couple of months in our kids or in our house youth, uh, we're, we're really welcoming people that have a heart for the next generation. Uh, we just had, we just prayed out a bunch of our, our young college uh, ladies to go to college. And so even in house youth, we have a youth group on Monday nights. If God's stirring in your heart saying, hey, I would like really pour into the, the lives of young women. I'm, I'm praying for some amazing uh, ladies to come alongside because we've got all these young girls and young boys that are coming and uh, they're really needing some mentors, some people to speak into their lives. So grab one of those connect cards and just come talk to me or, or Pat. We'd love to be able to answer any questions that you have. But ultimately, you have young people in your life surrounding you and they are looking to you to show them why Jesus loves them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up together. Let's go grab the hand of the person next to us. God, we just thank you for the person on our right and the person on our left. God, we thank you that you've been you called us to do this as the family of God. What, what an amazing thing. The weight isn't all on our, our one person's shoulders, but we get to do this together. We heard the challenge today, the admonition that you gave us, God, to pour our lives, our faith into the lives of the next generation. And God, we just thank you for the opportunity to do that together as we go from this place. We say we're going to give our best, God, to those who are looking to us for an example of faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 amen, amen. Listen, if you haven't seen the house kids decoration back there, you've got to go back there and see an amazing thing that Robin and the crew did back there. Thanks again, you guys, so much for coming. We'll see you next week. God bless.